Hey, y'all, and thank you for listening to and supporting Sweet Tea and TV. We've wrapped up season four and we're headed into season five. But before we get there, we wanted to do a quick flashback of some of our favorite Sweet Tea and TV episodes of all time. So for the month of September, you'll get a re-air every week. As usual, Mondays will be a main episode and Thursday you'll get an extra sugar. These are episodes we love so much, so we hope you'll enjoy revisiting them or if you're new around here, getting a sense for the best of Sweet Tea and TV. We'll be back in October with brand new season five episodes. Enjoy! Welcome, Selena. Yeah! This is very exciting. And welcome, everyone else. Welcome. You have to say, hey, y'all. Uh, We're flipping rolls. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so excited. <laughs> Hey, (laughs) y'all. We have a very special episode this week. The most special. The most, probably the most special. This is a mic drop walk away moment. Are you telling me you're ending the podcast after (laughs) this episode? I'm not. I'm not, but like I would feel satisfied. Okay. Like I'd had a meal. This one in some ways, you said it in the last episode, like this is like the... The ultimate, this is what we like started out to do. This does feel like the one where if we were brainstorming the podcast three years ago or whatever, this this would have been what we would have wanted to cover. Mm-hmm. Should we tell them what we want to cover today? Mm-hmm. That would time? probably be helpful, yeah. We're finally going to deep dive into Steel Magnolias. It felt like it deserved its own episode, a whole solid episode. So as a reminder, last week we covered the Designing Women two-parter the first day of the last decade of the entire 20th century. Um, We called that one Babies, Cars, and Dolly Parton. But we had two really big references that fall right in the wheelhouse of a podcast about the South and Southern representation on TV. Dolly Parton, our queen. Uh, an angel on earth mm -hmm. um and steel magnolias Mm -hmm. we got both of those references in one episode so it felt like let's do totally separate episodes on those so we're going to focus on steel magnolias with this episode and then this week's extra sugar is going to be dolly parton i'm calling it a deep dive on dolly love it so that's where we are that's this week wonderful well Before we get into the actual movie and all the things there are to cover there, I thought we could just loosen up a little, do a little warm up, if you will. Okay. Okay. Are you ready for this? Okay. All right. Is this going to take any energy from me? Because I got to hold on to my energy. I don't think so. I think it's just, it's just a question. Oh, I like questions. But before you answer, I think I can take a guess. But my question is, who is your favorite Still Magnolia's character? Oh, gosh. Here's my guess while you're thinking. Okay. Oh, do you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think you love them all. I think that's what you would say. But if you had to pick, if you had to make a selection, you're going to say Truvy. Mm. I'm wrong. Oh, my God, I'm wrong. Let me tell you this. Oh, I think my answer would change on different viewings. Okay. I think you might catch me say one character. Truvy is definitely a top. Sure. The other character that I really love a lot is Sally Field's character. Mm -hmm. And... I think Malin reminds me of, Sally Field in general reminds me of my mom. They just have, there's something about, their, they both have brown Demeanor. eyes. There's something about the way they, they're sort of a little bit low key, but also, like, I don't know. And so this time watching it in particular, I was struck by how much she reminds me of my mother. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a little bit of a tug to that that makes me feel like. Oh, that's mom. And I've thought that throughout the years watching this movie. Um, so I think you asked me that today. That's my answer today. I also really love Truvy. There are di- Anel. Anel probably never really makes my list, um, just to be honest. But I think every other character on different days probably I'll does. Almost said, but maybe not Anel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not. It's not that I don't love that character. I do. Yeah. There's just a couple of things with, over the course of the movie where it's a little cringy for me. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so well, do you want to take a shot at mine? Weezer. It's a tie mm. between Clary and Weezer. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, she's um, amazing. They're and, both amazing. Well, so and this is, so a twist on that question, maybe, I think it just depends on who you are. Who do you identify the most with? Weezer. <laughs> is it really? I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, she seems a little salty for you. 
That's such a good question. And this is the perfect time for me to think about who it would be. I think probably there have been times because of where we are in life that it's been Shelby. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Because like just sort of taking those big steps in her life that she's taking over the course of the movie from getting married to having a baby. Um, obviously I don't identify with the health issues at all. So I can't, I don't understand that part of life at all, but I think um, some of the things she says about wanting a family and some of the things she, she just, I kind of could identify with her probably. Okay. Okay. But then also Weezer. Cause I'm <laughs> crouch. <laughs> well, I think anytime you have these ensemble casts anyway, it's kind of like, all these pieces are a part of a person, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's what makes something so strong is because then you can really maybe identify at least a hair with everyone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to take a guess with who I can most identify with? Spud. Spud. <laughs> <laughs> Some weeks, yes. Casey does call me Eeyore from time to time. Um, I almost see you as a Truvy. Almost. Really? What a high compliment. Um, so mine's Weezer. No, no. Uh, when Weezer rounds the corner early on in the movie and says, this is it. I found it. I'm in hell. Um, is that like her bag falling off her shoulder? <laughs> Probably. Like her all... well, <laughs> yeah. That's you on a Monday. Yeah. So all I could think was, good God, it's me. <laughs> and I just really feel like that's kind of who, even if that's not who I'm portraying to people on the outside, because I don't know, like, I don't try and show that side of myself, like, immediately to someone, because, like, that's a lot. Uh, but that's who my insides have always been. I mean, possibly even when I was, like, five years old. I'm Like, I could always just kind of identify with Weezer. I was like, I get this lady. I get this. <laughs> she makes sense to me. Yeah, I'm understand. like, she's making some solid arguments. <laughs> she also has more money than God. Okay. I've just been in a really bad mood for 40 years. I mean, haven't we all? <laughs> Closing in on it. Ooh. <laughs> So what I wanted to do past that was start off with some basics um, because I think we do need to do a little scene setting. I mean, maybe not everyone listening to this, for one, has seen it. <laughs> Turn this off and go watch it if for you sure. Yeah. But number two is, right, if you haven't watched it in a while, this, you know, might be a little bit of a refresh for you so we can, like, start off from a similar place. So... First of all, we're not going to be holding back on spoilers, okay? Yeah. This is a deep dive. This is a celebration of a 33-year-old movie. So, in fact, I'm going to be spoiling it in about 25 seconds or so. So, you've been warned. Uh, Still Magnolias is about, this is our synopsis. We're going to start off like any Designing Women episode except make it Still Magnolias. Uh, it's about a group of Southern women whose friendship helps them cope through the trials and tribulations of life and death in a small Louisiana parish. And don't fret, Nikki, I did look across about three different synopses that I didn't care for to <laughs> make this one. I was it like, had to be perfect. Wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Uh, although I will say, because I think, depending on who you talk to, they might think it's Shelby's movie, or they oh. think it's Malin's movie, or they think it's a Nell's movie. So I think um, I think there's probably an argument for all Someone of them. Someone thinks it's a Nell's movie? Oh, we're going to get there. Oh, gosh. Okay, we're going to get, actually, uh, yeah, IMDb does. So, okay, so the movie Weird. premiered on November 15th, as you told us, in uh, episode 13 of... Now that I've said a number, November 15th, 1989, <laughs> starring Sally Field, Shirley MacLaine, Olympia Dukakis. These were all Academy Award winners at the time, as well as Dolly Parton, Daryl Hannah, and then breakout star Julia Roberts, who would go on to win an Academy Award herself in 2001. Supporting cast included Tom Skerritt, Dylan McDermott, not to be confused with <laughs> Dermot Mulroney. <laughs> Sam Shepard and Kevin J. O'Connor. That was off the cuff. Thank you. <laughs> you did my really good. Pop culture references. You did real good. It was directed by Herbert Ross, who we'll just talk about a little bit more in the trivia section. It's important, I think, to understanding the background of the movie. But the screenplay was written by Robert Harling, who we have talked about a little bit. But I feel like this is pretty well known. But for those who don't know, Still Magnolias is a film adaptation of Harling's 1987 play of the same name it is based in part on his sister susan harling robinson who died in 1985 of complications from type 1 diabetes 
in my research, I realized that he has actually written three of my all-time favorite movies and the most rewatched movies of my entire life. So well, that's good to know. Tell me more. It really like it blew my mind when I saw it just because I mean, I think you know what a movie person I am. Mm -hmm. It's it's like such a integral part of my life. And so that it was these two movies as well as Still Magnolias. I was just like, what is happening? Soap Dish and The First Wives Club. These oh, are okay. two additional movies that I have just seen a trillion times. I don't know Soap Dish. Nikki, get out your movie list. Okay. Because <laughs> it's going on there. So while Nikki puts this on her uh, movie list, because it is her turn this next time, despite an initial limited release, Still Magnolias de debuted at number four at the box office, and it stayed in the top 10 for 16 weeks, grossing more than $83.7 million domestically, or a little over $200 million today. That is a really darn impressive dramedy. Like, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen every day. Um, sir, so I don't even know. I don't even know if that would happen today. Honestly, the landscape is just so incredibly different. Yeah. If it's not a franchise, it just doesn't see those kinds of numbers anymore, no. unless it's some sort of really weird phenomenon. So this was a unique moment. So critical reception was somewhat mixed. It had a 68% on Rotten Tomatoes from critics. That is 68% of 34 critics reviews are positive. I always have to go back and look at that because that is just a little bit of a brain breaker for me. And then 89% audience score. So it means 30 some odd per percent of critics were wrong. <laughs> That's right. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. That's what I think you're hearing. Okay. A third of critics just have bad taste. And I can't help, I didn't look at all. Okay. I really just looked at Roger Ebert's. I just, um, I can't help but hearken back to when we first started covering Designing Women. And and I think I think it was at the end of season one, we talked a little bit about the critical reception and how when you looked across all of it, it was all men being like, what's all these women talking? Oh, yeah. Why is it all these women talking about their periods? Yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't exactly that, but kind of. So yeah. I can't help but wonder if some of that is in the sauce. So Julia Roberts won a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress. She and Sally Field were also nominated for an Academy Award that season for Best Supporting and Best Actor Best Supporting Actress and Best Actress, respectively. It was Robert's third movie. Mm -hmm. And it was her first nomination. So the movie won favorite drama motion picture at the People's Choice Awards. This is going off pure memory, so I apologize if I get this wrong. But funnily enough, with things that we've discussed already this season, I think it tied with Batman that year. Oh. <laughs> What a good year. Batman, man. It's just, <laughs> whew, we just didn't know what was coming. It's true. Anybody want a Marvel movie? <laughs> so I'm going to stop here briefly before we dive in, because again, that was just scene setting. Nikki, don't feel like you have to, but if you had any initial reactions or anything that's just out there for you already, I want to give you an opportunity to jump in. Well, I'm afraid to say too much because I don't know what else you have. Sorry, yeah, But I think tough. the um, the writer basing the story on her, his sister is once you know that I feel like it adds a layer to your view of the movie because you said it's based in part on his story with his sister it, it sounds like Shelby's story tracks pretty closely with his sister's story yeah. like wanting to have a baby even though doctors told her she shouldn't um I read some things or I've read things over the years where he says that um his his mother, so this like dynamic between Malin and Shelby is always a little bit tense. And it sounds like his mother's interaction with his sister about this particular topic were intense as well. And he was a little bit afraid that when his mom saw it, she was just going to feel some sort of negative way because it just hurts to see that played out in front of you. But he thinks actually it was really um, cathartic for her. And again, like I think in some, in some watches, cause I've seen this movie so many times, I, my opinion of things changes dynamically with it along with my life context. And there are times I watch Malin where I'm like, oh, why is she such a pain in the butt? Like Shelby just wants to live her life. And then now then you mom, mom, mom had on I watch that's it and right. I'm like she's just trying to protect her baby and it's yeah. just like all these varying layers so that's the thing of all the stuff you just talked about the writer's perspective and where he was coming from blows my mind every time yeah 
I'm just going to also give a full disclosure here that I talked to my mom about this movie yesterday and oh, uh-huh. full on sobbed talking to her. Oh. And I was like, God, I hope this gets some of it out. Because oh. I don't mind crying here as much as I mind the fact that if you can't understand what I'm saying any longer. But I was recounting some of the things. My mom didn't know it was based on the play, which blows my oh. mind. Blows my mind. Mm-hmm. But I... um uh you know, was walking her through, once I learned that, some of the factoids that we'll go through today, and just, I couldn't even get through it. And I was just like, <laughs> And so. that's, when you can't talk, it's kind of the worst kind of crying. Well, huh? and so I don't know how good that would be for an audio medium. <laughs> the other thing I'll say about, at some point I probably owe it to myself to watch the play in some sort of way, but I have to tell yeah. you, the scene you don't like setting- plays. I don't care for plays. And the scene setting, honestly, of this movie is part of what it what makes it what it is to uh-huh. me because even though we're not we don't live in Louisiana, the things they show feel southern to me. They feel like life experience. And so the scene setting is so important. And so a play set in a beauty parlor the entire time, it's hard for me to imagine. Yeah. So that would be hard for me to give up from the movie. Yeah, I could I, I understand that. I do. So but apparently it was a good play. People love I I think that is um, definitely accurate, and we'll talk about that as well. Okay. So just in terms of general thoughts, I think I'm already getting a little bit of a glimpse of maybe some of the things that you're talking about. And it's funny, as you, as you were um, c- kind of giving your opening to things, it had me thinking a little bit about uh, what I wasn't able to articulate as I was going through this, but yet, like, the way that you feel about this movie, because it's been a part of our lives for so long, it really does change over time. Mm -hmm. And you may identify with a a particular storyline or something just depending on where you are in in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really something. But what other general thoughts did you have that you want to share? Well, you know, something when I was watching it this year, because This is, I mean, I've probably watched it. I watch it every year around Easter. Let me say that first. This is my Easter movie. I have holiday movies and it's not the holidays till I watch it. This is my Easter movie and it's not Easter until I've watched this movie. So it perfectly coincided. I know it perfectly (laughs) coincided with Easter this year. But every time I watch it, like you said, I notice new things. But one thing that strikes me and we've been doing this podcast for a few years now, looking at an 80s TV show now 90s and we point out all these things that are really dated in the storyline this movie holds up really well Mm -hmm. given that it's 33 years old Mm -hmm. we have a section I think later in the show where we're going to talk about some 80s things and some dated things so there are definitely things that stick out as old but by and large there are no like off-color sayings there's nothing really offensive in the movie that doesn't hold up there's not a ton that dates it like there's not a ton of pop culture references there's not a ton of things that are of that time that's really rare to come across a movie made in the late eighties that I don't watch and say like, this is an eighties movie. It's starting to look a little old, but it feels still, it feels relevant to me. And I think some of that might be that small town vibe, Mm -hmm. right? You know, small towns are always a little slower. um, And I don't mean that in a bad way at all. It's just, um, I just, it's not as quick pace as like even being in the suburbs, you know? And I think, um, and I think when you are dealing with those basic tenets of life, life, mm-hmm. death, and weddings, and, and, and having baby, like those things march on no matter what iPhone version you have right. in your hand now, you know. Right. Uh, so I think, I, okay, I don't know if this sounds weird, but I'll just say it. Watching this movie makes me feel very proud to be a woman. Mm, yeah. Their strength their intuition and their bond in this movie is so beautiful and it's beautiful in real life too. And you already mentioned that complicated relationship between Shelby and Malin. And I would just say it captures that complicated and sacred Mm -hmm. relationship between mother and daughter. And it captures also that relationship between best friends. In some cases it can be both for people, right? Mm -hmm. And in both situations, we may, whether it be your best friend, your mom or both, you may aggravate the crap out of each other sometimes, but we love each other all the time. And it's cool that it's almost intergenerational in some ways. I, I think it's it was really genius to put Malin at a certain age, then you have 
Weezer and Clary at a certain age. You have Shelby at a certain age who kind of, I think she and Anel are probably about the same age with Shelby yeah, maybe airing a little right. younger, living two totally different life experiences. But all of these differences and they still sort of come together in that universal experience of being a woman and walking through life together. And mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with you. I think that's, it's genius. <laughs> it's just genius. <laughs> it's genius. Can I tell you, uh -huh. there are some signs, some scenes that make me cry, like no matter how many times I've seen them, no matter what I know is coming. So when I was watching this for this um, episode, I had to split it up over two days and I watched it in the morning before my daughter came down. <laughs> yeah. And I watched it. Um, I was watching it one morning when she came down the stairs and it was the part where um, Shelby collapses on the floor and um, Jackson comes home to the baby crying. Mm -hmm. And I was in full on, and she didn't have any of the context. So she was like, what is happening in this movie? And I was like, she's on the ground because she's going to die. And it's just so <laughs> She's looking at me like I'm a crazy person. That scene will make me cry every freaking time. Every time. When like Malin runs out of cry. And when Malin <laughs> runs out of the hospital to go get Jack Jr. Mm -hmm. Something about that entire scene when she runs out of the hospital, she gets in the car, they have their panning, the scenic view. He toddles across the little pathway to her. You see the aunt. She's all rumpled and you can tell they just woke up in the morning. <sighs> Well, I think it's because you can sort of capture in that moment, too, this idea that she's like, that's her piece of Shelby left in the world. Which is what Shelby told her. Shelby told her that's why she wanted a baby, because that was her piece of immortality. And so Sally Field's character gets to experience that finally. She gets to see what Shelby said all along. Let me ask you something. Did we start a Still Magnolias podcast and not bring we, in Kleenex? Yeah. <laughs> you probably should have had some. So that's happening. Yeah, uh, that that part. And then, of course, Malin's breakdown at the funeral. Yeah. It is broken so beautifully with humor. Yeah. But I've been to enough funerals that I know what that feeling feels like. And I cannot fathom that being your baby. It's just too much. It is too much. It's too much. It is. Steel magnolias, you know? <laughs> so am, am I right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I. The other thing I wanted to say, too, is like watching this movie – um, puts me in my feels about the women I love the most in my life. Yeah. Um, the Don't ones, go too far down that path. I know. The <laughs> ones I just feel like I can't live without. And, yeah. um, you know, the ones who have held me up or got me through. I mean, it's it's really hard not to think about your own mom, you yeah. know. Love you, mom. Um, it's just impossible not to. Um, yeah. And think about just... That there's no, even when to just push you off, there's no other relationship like it. You know why? Because you were a part of them, you know. Because she was there when you came into this world. <laughs> she was there as you drifted Are out. Are you of crazy? <laughs> <laughs> so on reflection, I I was also thinking in this time around, especially with the kind of deep dives that we've done into designing women, how amazing. It is that Hollywood bankrolled an all-female movie in 1989. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if the studios were taking note of the Golden Girls, the Designing, Designing Women's, women. the Murphy Browns, and realizing that, well, I thought, well, maybe these women have something. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there are women in the world. I also thought a lot about how this is one of my favorite movies um, and possibly one of the best movies ever. Mm -hmm. And I think I've built a case for it. Okay. But I wanted to see what you thought. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> In case you want to argue that this is a horrible movie. Which I'm would not, be weird. I, sh I refuse to argue that. The other thing, though, that I didn't mention in yeah. general thoughts, but may be relevant here, is that I think I watched this movie probably for the first time in the realm of fried green tomatoes and beaches. Like I kind of lump all these together. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious as you go into this, I'm kind of keeping space in my mind for other movies like that. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it's so funny because what you're saying is um, in my memory section too. Oh. <laughs> and it's definitely about fried green tomatoes. So um, I, the first thing that I thought about a lot on rewatch and and watching it through this kind of critical lens, which I haven't done before, is just how unbelievable the writing is. 
It is the most quotable thing I have ever seen. I started to write down all of my favorite lines, and then I had to stop because I realized it would just be me reenacting the movie. I limited mine to Truvy's uh-huh. quotes because she has a handful that I just, they, they're tops for me, uh-huh. but I also wrote a few down and it's I have to stop myself. It's tough. I wrote some down for the Southern section um, and then I had a couple that were just so, like if it really struck me in this time through and it wasn't what I was thinking of, it was hard. It was hard. That's what I'm saying. I don't know if another movie takes the viewer as successfully through all of the emotions, Mm. but somehow still feels balanced on the other end. It is genuinely one of the saddest, funniest, and most thoughtful movies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of people get swept up in the big stuff that happens, but I want to make an argument that Still Magnolias is also a million small moments. Mm -hmm. Like the Spud Truby stuff. Well, like that too, So, which are like kind of like these diverting plot lines, but I'm thinking like um, similar to like how a great comic hones in on these things that we think or do, but we don't tell anybody about, but everybody kind of knows. And then you're like, I do tie my shoes that way. How did you know? But like when they're heading into the chapel for the wedding and the interaction between Malin and her son is so funny to me. (laughs) He steps on her foot. He steps on her foot. And you could just, it's like some mixture of like, I love you, but also you're really getting on my nerves like these last three years. Um, And then they sit down and he farts. Oh, I'm not sure I've ever noticed that. Yeah, he, you hear like a little noise and he goes, sorry. <laughs> oh, I thought that was him apologizing for stepping on her foot. That's it, when they're walking. Oh my god! Then gosh. they're sitting down. I've and, never noticed that. Yeah, he like, like a little toot squeezes out. <laughs> Teenage boys. Exactly. And it's just oh like gosh. this perfect capture of like all of that. It's so oh wonderful. Oh my god. And you get a lot of that in the movie before it goes to all these emotional tones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, so that's my case is just like, it captures the big, it captures the small, the writing is so good. It's so quotable. It's so emotional, but like balanced. That's my argument for making it one of the best movies. Yes. But I do. And I didn't even go into the, all the good, like the, like such a good cast and all of that. But those are all of my reasons why I think it's tops for me. Um, How do you feel about the end of this movie after the funeral scene? So everything in the closing Easter scene. I'm worried that this is a leading question that's going to walk me into the wrong answer. But I'll say, it's fine. It's fine for me. I like, I now what I will tell you is I think it's a little bit odd that um, uh, Anel wanted to name her baby (laughs) Shelby, whether it was a boy or a girl. And the fact that she said it at the... um, post-funeral like gathering at the, the house I just this didn't feel like great timing to me so this idea and Nell after that it's just sort of awkward to me that she's going into labor when poor Malin's still trying to grieve but it, it like the feel and this is what I'm talking about like what I love about the movie is the feel of everything feels like Easter in my childhood like it just feels like Easter egg hunts and our cute little Easter outfits and our baskets and I like little Jack still looks outfit very much the same there As is, last weekend taught me. Yeah. And there is literally a pitcher that uh, Malin is pouring out of that we've talked about before. It's the blue pitcher with the white lid. She's pouring uh-huh. sweet tea out. My mom has that pitcher. <laughs> to this day, my mom has that pitcher. That's our sweet tea pitcher. So like everything about that final bit of the movie feels like my life memory. And then I feel like it brings the whole story full circle. Okay. So I really like it. So I've got zero problem with it. I will say that like the funeral scene is such um, an iconic, I don't know, eight minutes of cinema that I, most of the time I don't even think about the end part really. Mm. Um, I'm glad they didn't end with the funeral. Let me just say that. Yeah. And I think, so what I was um, read at some point that I just never really thought about before is like that was added on. For the movie. The funeral was? No, 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 no. The funeral was definitely part of the play. The Easter part. Then. The Easter part. So okay. that whole part is pretty much tacked on. And um, and I think some people read it as feeling tacked on. And I do think I can see that. And I think some people saw it as a little trite. Like, similar to what you were saying in episode 13, like life coming into the world on one side and going out of the world so perfectly on the other side. Yeah. Like, yes, that's happening all the time, but 
Um, I think that was some people's reading of that scene. And so I just was wondering if that had ever been something that you had thought about. It was not something I thought about. It's funny because I don't think you can end the movie without closing Anel. So this goes to that argument of whose movie is it? I don't think of it as Anel's movie, but I think we've talked about her pregnancy enough and she said she was going to name her baby Shelby that it just would feel awkward to end the movie without her delivering a baby. Yeah. So I appreciate, and I don't, I want to know how Malin is carrying on sometime after losing her daughter. I want to see that play out. And I want to know that her friends are still there, that there's still a community and there's still a network, even after the hard part of life ended. Do you know what I mean? Or one of the hard parts of life ended. Yeah. I mean, I think it's okay to end on a hopeful note. It also bookends. So you start with these very scenic views and you see Anel walking through the streets and then you bookend with these very scenic views with Anel headed toward the hospital for another major life event. It's a nice bookend to me. Yeah. Am I arguing those people who think it's tacked on? Because that's what I'm doing right now. (laughs) You argue on. Because I thought like at first, I think they had me swayed at first. And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, no, because if it ended at a funeral scene, even if you get like that cathartic moment with Weezer, where you get to laugh and you feel like you're coming like oh, down a little bit. I don't think that's enough decompression from the so does the play thirty end there? minutes that you've cried. Um, I actually don't know how the play ends. I just know the Easter thing is specifically a like because of the movie. Yeah, between all of those hospital scenes, like Malin doing the exercises with Shelby. Um, Malin sitting there and reading to her from Cosmo. It's 30 minutes of straight crying. Watching the men cry, watching them sign the paperwork to end her life, to Malin running to the baby and then to the funeral. It is truly like a huge buildup, an emotional buildup. Yeah. Those people are so stupid. Not tacked on. <laughs> well, hold back. I'll hold back now. Um, how dare you talk about my mother that way? <laughs> so, um... Stray observations. Stray observations. So this is, I'm going to get back to whether my first stray observation, we've kind of already circled around, but is there an argument that this is a Nell's movie? So I, I hadn't thought about it that way until I saw that really interesting IMDb synopsis that's like it, it just the way it's written it's like centered on Anel like Anel comes into town and <laughs> like, I was like what anyways so I'm gonna say some points so that I think could be an argument for it is one she goes through potentially the most amount of transition in the movie um she moves to town she's been through a really weird relationship we don't know exactly what's happened there she goes through a reawakening spiritually um, as she as she finds she finds Jesus again maybe for the first time I'm not really sure um, and then she starts a new relationship and she's having a baby by the end mm-hmm. she's also the bookend for the entire movie mm-hmm. we she is our entree into this world and into this group mm-hmm. and she is having the major event at the end mm-hmm. so I'm not saying it's her movie I'm just saying. I can, there is a part of me that's like, okay, IMDb, I gotta see how you wrote it that way. Um, that is so funny. That never would have, this is no. a Shelby movie. This is about Shelby and Malin. Everybody else is just supporting characters. Truly. I mean, Shelby experiences the biggest life transition. She dies. That's true. Malin experiences the second biggest life transition. She loses a child. Yeah. Everybody else is supporting them. Yeah. A transition may have not been the right word. I know what you mean. The most character development or the most, yeah. character development thing. Yeah, but I don't know. Because I don't think Shelby changed. No, I don't think so. And I don't think Malin really changed. We wouldn't know unless we could see her I think Malin did. Okay. I think when Shelby passed away, she changed. So she has that moment at the funeral. She says, she's right. It is a brown football helmet. And then she says, um... Uh, going to run to Jack Jr., that whole thing about him being like her connection to the world. I think Mm -hmm. she changed in realizing, holy crap, my child was teaching me something this whole time. She knew what she was talking about. She knew this is what life is all about. And that's what she was, yeah, I I think she, I think there was an an element of change. It's just so strange. And I came in hot on the Anel thing, but it's just not as much as Anel though, because Anel goes goes through like a wild child phase. We don't get to see it. But she's such a supporting character. I know. I know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just Until reporting I see the news. Laid out drunk on the street. I haven't seen the wild child. 
Yeah. I don't know. I, that's so fascinating that in all my years of watching this movie, I never would have like put this as an Anel movie. Right. Also, I think the crushing argument is that Robert Harling wrote it about his sister. So That was um, me crushing the argument. But yeah, you should have seen me when I read that synopsis the first time. I was like, what the what? <laughs> Anyways, but then I was like, well, we have to talk about it now. Um, okay, so this is another stray for me. This has always bothered me. Early on, Clary says Anel is too young for a past because she's all of 18. Mm. Sure, me too. <laughs> I looked it be more than 19. I, I looked it up. Um, she would have been 28 when the movie was filmed. Yeah, I, it seemed to me that Shelby was a little bit younger I think than even right. Anel. Like Shelby, in my mind, just graduated college. Yeah. Anel's the woman who's lived some things. So, drum and Weezer. This is something else I've got to ask you about. I already have my answer, but I'm still going to ask. Were they like hot for each other? Drum and Weezer? Oh, gosh. I, I. <laughs> Oh, see. y'all should have seen the shock in her eyes. She was not expecting that question. I was not prepared for that because I see him as a little brother to her big sister. Okay. And he's like poking her like a little brother pokes his big sister. Oh. Not poking that way. Nope. Well, once nope. you once you went to brother and sister, I left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will just say I've always thought the answer was yes. I've always thought they kind of had a thing for each other. What? Yeah. They're just, it's like an immature flirting they're just old and flirting. Like all that reads like flirting to me. Drum feels like a very immature grown man. And I think Weezer that's right. is a very, very easy target because she gets so angry. So he will do anything to irritate her because she gives him the reaction she he wants. Yeah, she's an easy target. Oh, God. I am not. I am not owning any of this. Gross. Ew. Gross. Ew. What? <laughs> there are these. Well, except for the fact that he's married. They're both consenting adults. Yeah. G- gross. Ew. Let's. Stop. I didn't say I agreed with it. I just said they've always read like there's some chemistry there. Okay. So, what stray observations do you have, if any, or anything else that you want to discuss before we move on to memories? Let me put it that way. Nothing else to discuss before we move on to memories. Um, so I don't really have a ton of memories to share because most of it's just like me watching this movie and crying. Um, but I will say that I totally identify with what you were saying earlier where you like have these moments where absolutely you're going to cry. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it is at that moment where Shelby falls and then on out. But like there's a little Pavlov's dogs going on for me too. Oh. Whereas almost sometimes the minute that music, the music up, starts. It's like, I know what's coming uh-huh. and I just, I'm already there. Um, so I don't remember the first time I saw it, but given I was talking to my mom yesterday and then realizing, oh, yep, we're related. She was like, when did that come out? I was like, and I told her and she was like, well, when did it come out on video? I was like, mom, I don't know. I don't know. She, but she like starts Googling it. Oh, and she, she found it. Answers. Oh, when? <laughs> um, so it was released out June of 90, I think is what oh, she okay. said. Good Lord. That's fast. Is it? It came out in November of 89. Oh, that would be really fast. Oh, now I don't, now I don't trust it. Anyways, it doesn't matter. I would have seen it. Trust, but verify. Sometime. Cause yeah, it used to take like a year for me yeah. to come out. Maybe it was closer to the holidays or something. Anyways, she thinks that I probably saw it for the first time when I was like six. June 19th, 1990. Oh, look at that. Sorry, mom. I didn't mean to <laughs> not believe you. That is so fast. That is really fast. So anyways, but we were. That was just what we did. We rented movies. We watched movies. She was like, there's no way I didn't rent that. She was like, I love that movie so much. And she was like, you definitely would have seen it. And the funny thing is, is I remember watching it back to back with Fried Green Tomatoes. Once Fried Green Tomatoes came out. I, I When I think about this movie, my earliest memories are somewhere in that Beaches Fried Green Tomatoes category. Like when I was old enough to process each one of these movies and like the emotional value. So probably like middle school is probably the first time. But like I said, I've, I've watched it. I'm like you. I've watched it so many times. It's hard to tie a specific memory to it because I just, just watch it. It's just a movie I watch. Well, I do have one other memory of it, which is... Before I watched it in preparation for this episode, the, the last, last time, time I watched it was with you and your mom. For the 30th anniversary, probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, we went to the movie theater. They were showing it. Had to. Had and to see it. 
I also, when I cry in movies, I don't want other people to know I'm crying. Like when I was a kid, they used to make fun of me because I would cry at everything. I just am a crier. So I used to be really embarrassed. So I remember going to see it even then. I was like, suck it back in. Suck it back in. Don't cry. Please don't cry. Please don't cry. Even in front of my mom. Like I just don't want to be that weepy. And she weirdly doesn't cry. Weirdly doesn't cry. And I'm like, how are you not crying right now? (sighs) My mom cries for all of us. My mom, like, you can definitely see how she acted. I mean, just like, it just flips right off. It's a shame that I didn't become an actor because I can pretty much cry on demand. That's all you have to be able to do. I have like a handful of memories I can draw on every time that will make me cry, whether it's this movie, other movies I've seen. I've got them. I just tap in and immediately go. Um, But this movie just every freaking time makes me cry. And it's hard to remember a life not watching this movie. Like, I don't remember not having seen Steel Magnolias. I've seen it more than I've not seen it, if that makes sense. Well, it's been for most of our conscious life, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, most of our memories aren't before age four. Yeah. So um, I think that makes sense. Uh, I thought we could talk a little bit about favorite parts. Too many to name. Who is what about? Too many to name. Oh, okay. All right. Well, moving on. I'm just kidding. I love the wedding scene. I love all of it, Mm -hmm. like the reception, the dance circle, normally like a dance circle is going to turn me off, but those people doing like the, um, almost like the line dancing of sorts. I love it. I love the whole thing. Yeah. I think it's delightful. I've said already, I love the scene setting parts and now walking through the, the small town in the beginning, the Christmas festival. Um, I just really like the celebration of small town, how it feels confined. Mm Mm-hmm. But also like warm and welcoming, like a warm blanket. I think this was the most I'd ever paid attention to that the first part, like before they actually get to Truvies mm-hmm. and when she is walking through the town and how beautiful those houses Gorgeous. are. Woo. Gorgeous. Goodness. And there's stuff like there's a little baseball team crossing the street and just it's all very small town. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I'll say that I really, really like about it is like we talked about it a minute ago, quotes. Uh huh. Do we have a whole section for quotes? No. Okay. Okay, good, because I, I put them right here. Oh, good, One perfect. of my favorites is when Dolly says, um, any good shoe, I wear a size six, but a seven feels so good, I buy a size eight. They're eight and a half? Perfect. I love that. <laughs> it's great. Of course, Shelby saying three minutes of wonderful, like she'd rather have three minutes of wonderful than a lifetime of nothing special. Mm-hmm. What a wonderful, who writes that? Who Robert writes Harley. that? <laughs> um, a I man. love the part where Anel decorates the porch. And then she says, hide that cord so it don't look tacky. <laughs> As if that's the thing. I know. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Clary is saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, come sit by me. I don't think of anyone else but you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love the the lines. They're so great. Yeah. It's, it's, they're just all good. So my, for, my first one, every scene with Tom Skerritt. Oh, he's I, very funny. Yeah. Bonus if it includes Weezer. So, honestly, I like seeing the two of them together. Not like that. I think I you've just, just invented a relationship to make yourself feel, feel something. better. <laughs> feel something. I, I just need to feel something. <laughs> um, so, the iconic armadillo cake scene where she Jeez. cuts off the tail and hands it to Drum and he says, ain't nothing like a good piece <laughs> of ass. Who Nikki doesn't think there's any flirting going on here. That's okay. Um, it's weird flirting, but... He, some people flirt weird. It's I don't int- think it's flirting. It's just showing her, like, you can't bother me. But what? I don't care. I'm going to eat it anyway. <laughs> it's interesting that some of the criticism of the movie I read was that the male characters weren't fully formed. Mm-hmm. So, first of all, uh, insert about eight cuss words here, okay? I don't want to hear about a not fully mm-hmm. formed male character. But also, um, I thought all the men in this movie were great. With the one exception being Truvy's son, he also felt very tacked on to me and random. You know who he's always reminded me of? Who? Like a young Val Kilmer. Oh, I could see that. I could see that. I think when I was really little, I thought it was him. Oh. But because, well, I was like, like probably six. <laughs> and I was like, is that Val Kilmer? You know what's so funny about that is like the brothers, they don't have very much of a role in the movie. Mm-mm. But they feel as fully formed as they need. Like at the end, at the funeral, when um, the dad gives one of the sons a hug. I don't know how to explain it because it's not going to sound articulate. But I remember thinking like this is 
full circle for him. Well, like, you see a sea change because it's the kid that farted in the pew. <laughs> Thank you. And Maybe that's suddenly, what it is. like, like they finally, or the, like, and I don't blame him. Sorry. But when he's at the one year old's birthday party and he's like, oh, this boring <laughs> shit. <laughs> like, I was like, it's me at the one year old's birthday party. <laughs> And so, like, I was like, dude, I see you. But also, like, it's true. But you, so you see all of that, or the jokes, even when Shelby's about to go to, go surgery, to surgery. And then yeah. it's, it's real. Yeah. It's real after that. It's hit the skids. And, um, and he's still so young. Some growth. Well, apparently, one of those is probably Robert. Yeah. I mean, that was occurring played to me much while we were younger, talking. right? Because yeah. by this point, he's out Old and about to, yeah, living in, in New, New York. York. Yeah. Right. So, um, uh, but yeah, that's, I think that's fair. Another favorite for me is really every little moment with Clary and Weezer. Yeah. I think they're the cutest. I mean, they're so mean to each other, but I love it. When they're buying pork and beans. You know, when they're store. flirting with each other. <laughs> Um, I just want to be their best friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's no room for you. They've got each other. No, there's, there isn't. I'm not, I'm not cool enough. But it's not cool enough. Or they're rich just, enough. They're complete enough without you. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> when do we get to your dream so I can crap all over it? <laughs> so when, um, but like also when Weezer forces Clary to walk her home after the wedding yeah. and it's like, she's like, you live a block away. <laughs> it definitely, this is just, I don't know when we were, I was telling her earlier about how like a good comedian knows how to hone in on these things. These are like conversations I feel like I've had with my, my friends, <laughs> you know, like, where they're like, me <laughs> like literally the other weekend I had to call my friend from the parking garage at the works and be like, please come park my car. I don't, <laughs> I like rolled down the window riding by them and I was like, help me. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, but, or them in the locker room together after the game and all those football players are running around half naked. And she just they, like, I, good friends. Like, could she have done it nicer? Yes. But she's like, you're making an idiot of yourself. <laughs> Nobody gets about this. <laughs> um, about the colors of uniforms. Anyways. Um, all of the salon scenes are up there for me. And let me tell you why. I think that I hear you on feeling like you would lose out on some things when it's in the play. But in terms of a movie and so much of it being in the salon, while that is obviously a relic of the play, it's a much less clunky way for us to get exposition about the characters. Mm -hmm. At, at the same time, we were able to show what was going on with Shelby mm -hmm. and experience it together. And I think that ratcheted up the emotional component, sure. right? Yeah. So first, we see just how bad her diabetes can get. Mm -hmm. Though, I read that it's downplayed, both in the play and the movie. Um, how tired and emotional she is when she gets all her hair cut off. Mm -hmm. It's just these signals, right? Mm -hmm. um, we see the dialysis marks, what that's doing to her. Um, and it's how we find out about the kidney transplant. So we get these big mile markers. And I just think it does a really nice, it, it, it serves as a good backdrop for that. Uh, and it, also for the passage of time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also where we get some of the best interactions. And we get to see the women really forge and deepen these bonds. Because you get the idea that like, some of these characters were weren't as close maybe when the movie started, but some of these really difficult things start happening and then they come closer together. Um, so, so the scene where Shelby tells Malin she's pregnant, when I was little, that part used to bore me. Mm. Uh, and so just thinking about the things we've been talking about so far and how as we've grown up and watched this movie, how things hit us differently, I appreciate it so much more now mm -hmm. that I'm older and I think the acting is just so spot on. Mm -hmm. It's so natural and relatable mm -hmm. in some weird way, even though like that's never happened to me, but just this bumping of heads between mom and daughter. Mm -hmm. And then the line that you said, this is where Shelby says, I would rather have three minutes of wonderful than a lifetime of nothing special. I wrote that down because I think that this watch is the first time that that line has ever hit me in the way that it did this time. And I don't know if that's just getting older um, or just like I've never had to really watch it this closely before or, or what. 
Uh, but it just really hit me in such a more profound way this time. Hmm. When all the still magnolias gather in the other room at the Christmas party because they understand Malin is really going through something and that Shelby's pregnancy isn't all sunshine and rainbows, I really like that part a lot. I used the word intuition earlier. Another word is paying attention. I, I think you really see that on the part of the friends here. It takes them a second, though. They assume this is good news. Everybody but Weezer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Oh, but because she asked, like, why are you so grouchy? Because she was paying attention. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that women have the ability to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually really liked the, even though maybe it's not as fleshed out as it could be, when Spud is there and he is dressed and ready for that funeral and how happy Truvy is mm-hmm. just that he shows up and he is present in all of the ways. I really like that a lot. It makes me so sad, though, that her bar is so low that that's exciting. I know. I know. Which I think is why their relationship trips me up. And, you know, and I think low bar or, like, not understanding depression or, like, you know, whatever. the Like, but for someone who is in that dark of a place, that is an exciting thing. But he's the the one thing. So I definitely think he's depressed. The yeah. one thing that sticks in my head is the part where he's working on the car and she's sitting out there and she's trying to pour her heart out to him and she's right. trying to tell him like, just really makes me realize how much they have each other. And he's like, hand me that screwdriver. And I just realized like, I don't think that's depression. I think that's someone who just doesn't care enough about you to listen. Mm. Hey, who said you can't have both? It's true. <laughs> Lucky gal. <laughs> who said you can't? Uh, the funeral scene of course we talked a, a good bit about that but I had a couple of walkaways from this this time too uh that I wanted to share which is one beware of any woman who says she's fine mm, no you're never fine I think it may be this movie that taught me to duck and I'm cover fine. <laughs> not fine she's not my daughter is um Anel a study in things you shouldn't say To anyone. Uh, God bless her heart. I know she's trying. She's trying the best she can. I think it just always reminds me. It's why normally when I get condolence cards, they're blank. Because I feel like there aren't any right words. Um, But I don't know. Then, of course, the breakdown of all breakdowns, followed by the most iconic lines that reverberate through my ears at least twice a week. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. Half a chickapin parish. Give their eye teeth to take a whack at Weezer. So much so that I am wearing a shirt. It talks about Weezer right now. And I would never slap Weezer. I would, however, like to be Weezer. <clears throat> so, are you ready for a little movie trivia and background? Yes. <laughs> we've, we've barely talked. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can't promise for the biggest Still Magnolia fans that we can cover any new ground, but I combed through several articles and websites to aggravate, mm-hmm, aggravate, to aggregate the best list that I could um, of the most interesting things that I could find. And I just want to say, if you've never read the garden and gun oral history for designing, for, for designing women's shirt, if you guys would do that, that would be fantastic. Um, But in the meantime, read it for still magnolias. It is excellent. And we'll link to that from the blog post. Like I cried reading it, Uh, but also Southern living has things. AFI has things. And um, you know, we'll link to all of those as well. And just to say like, this is not my original research, <laughs> you know. This is secondary research, and um, just that uh, I'm very appreciative that these things are on deck and that we can share these with you today. So we have to talk a little bit about the play because without it and its success, there is no movie. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite bits in that Garden and Gun oral history was a reflection of the play's initial off Broadway, off Broadway run. There was so much buzz. And major stars were showing up every night. I'm not going to go through all the lists, but among them, every single golden girl was there in the audience. Mm. I thought you'd like that. Then came Elizabeth Taylor. They had to close down the street when she came. When Truvy said her line, when it comes to suffering, she's right up there with Elizabeth Taylor. No one laughed harder than Liz herself, and it made the nightly news, which I thought was real cute. All of the main characters are based on real people who are friends of Harling's mom. He said he'd never reveal who Weezer is based on, but he was very nervous that she would figure it out. Oh, dang. (laughs) Instead, every woman in town thought it was based on them. Perfect. (laughs) Excellent. 
And I can't decide if that's everybody having a really weird reading on themselves or everyone right. just wants to be Weezer. Right. Or maybe just old women are all a little bit grouchy. Uh, well, yep. <laughs> and some of us were born that way. <laughs> So the play also doesn't include any men, which we've talked about a little bit. It's almost entirely set in Truvy's beauty shop. So both the inclusion of male characters and things like being at the Christmas festival and all of that, that's all movie inventions. Mm -hmm. So, and if you haven't caught on to that from the 15 conversations we've had about it up until now, then the movie takes place in Chincapin Parish, which I feel like I'm butchering the pronunciation pronunciation of that but um there is no such place it was actually fil filmed in Natchitoches mm -hmm. so and that is um where Harling is from we've talked a little bit about that the producer who bought the rights and won out over other people who also wanted the rights to it he promised to film it here in the hometown where Harling and his sister grew up and that's actually what sealed the deal Oh, and cool. think about the impression that it's left on you all these mm -hmm. years. That, that you was the right choice. felt all those things. Yeah, it's sim similar to what you were saying when we were watching episode 13. It takes you out of it a little bit when you're paying attention like you do. And you see that it is sunny California outside right. what should be a snowy winter window. Yeah. Uh, you can stay at Malin's house. Nice. It is a and b We'll link to an article in case you want to go. To be clear, I want to go. But you have to call them to make a reservation, just so you know. Uh, and I don't make phone calls. <laughs> so I will never be staying there. That's true. But you could ask your husband to do that for you. I bet you he would. You have to call them and potentially get told no, that they're booked that weekend. That's horrible. I need a computer to tell me no. Not oh, a person. No. Yeah, that's tough. Worst case scenario. <laughs> Uh, do you think they just say no and hang up on you? Probably, yeah. <laughs> Try again. You idiot. Get out of here. We don't even want your money. Come back on a less popular weekend. <laughs> I don't know. So also, according to this oral history, the cast became really good friends, and they still are really good friends to this day. At oh, least, really? Yeah, at oh, least cool. the core female cast. Oh, okay. Uh, Julia Roberts and Dylan McDermott, their on-screen romance led to a real romance. Did you read about any of this? I think I've heard that before. Okay. Um, so this turned into an engagement, but they broke up in 1990. She got engaged to Dermot Mulroney. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, they have been in a movie together. Um, she apparently broke it off with Liam Neeson to be with McDermott. Oh Julia Roberts and Liam Neeson. <laughs> An unlikely duo at best. I mean, she was a wild love it. That yes, feels like, right. That's that true. feels like the most unlikely pair. No shade, Julia. You do you. But it's just Absolutely, you do you. I, I just took it to mean that Lyle Lovett w was a really amazing person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love it. Um, Dolly and Daryl Hannah learned how to do hair to make the beauty shop scenes work. Oh. Especially that first one, which is like, they're just all doing hair uh -oh, uh -huh. for about 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't convince me Dolly didn't know how to do hair before that. <laughs> That, well, I mean, yeah, maybe just not that specifically. Yeah. Uh, although I would argue she's probably had someone doing her hair for a long time, and even by then. Yeah. Shirley MacLaine said of Dolly, this is her quote, It was really hot. There was Dolly with a waist cincher no more than 16 inches around and hills about two feet high and a wig that must have weighed 23 pounds. And she's the only one of us who didn't sweat. She never complained about anything. Never. The rest of us were always complaining. I saw that on TikTok a few months ago. It was actually a cast interview from when the, um, I think when the movie came out. I think actually it was Julia, Julia Roberts, Roberts telling a version of that story. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say, having done the extra sugar on Dolly Parton, knowing some of the things she was going through in her life at this point, um, puts puts kind of a finer, um, and maybe like a context around that or like a um, casts a little bit of a shadow on why she was feeling that way at that point in time. Uh, not to say Dolly like is always, she's always seemed very grateful for what she has. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that, but I do just wonder if some of the things going on had given her a little bit of a different perspective. Oh, that's interesting. You teeing us up? I am. Uh, I think, yeah, I saw what Julia Roberts said too. I can't remember why I included uh, Shirley McLean's and not Julia's, but I think it, in, in what Julia said too, that is a little bit of a twist on this is Dolly was like, all I ever wanted to do was be rich and famous. And mm -hmm. I am and so. I'm that. So what do I have to complain yeah, about? Yeah. So life is good. Yeah. And I was like, dang, that is some really good perspective 
So Dolly's got great perspective. She really does. I am so excited for your extra sugar. So I've, you know, I've never put together that Olympia Dukakis was related to Michael Dukakis, who ran for president back in 88. Not uh-huh. sure. It's not like there's a ton of Dukakises running around. I mean, you but just don't think about Michael Dukakis all that often, I'm sure. Uh, not every day, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although I feel like I watch a show where maybe a succession on HBO Uh-oh. where the, they named their dog Dukakis, I Uh-oh. think. But other than that, nope, not a lot. I mean, you ran in 88, so you were three. Yeah, I mean, but I what? yeah, I wasn't as into pol- politics as I was by four. <laughs> so anyways, uh, they're cousins in real life. And so he's running for president right in the time they're filming. She was apparently involved in the campaign, and she even spoke at the Democratic Convention the area, however, perfect fit for Natchitoches. <laughs> so the area, however, in this parish is very Republican. But to be Don't neighborly, say. some people put out Dukakis signs. That's lovely. I think that's the sweetest thing I've ever heard. I can't see that happening today. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe not. I just think things are too volatile. Individually, people are still good. I hope so, but I just thought I was like that. Really warmed my heart. Like, almost more than anything else did. Because that is just such a... That is Southern. I think if you hear it personally from someone that you like and is charming, then you're like, yeah, sure, I'll put the sign up. If someone just leaves a sign on your front porch or if someone, like, tells you something horrible is going to happen if you don't vote for this person, you're much less likely to do it. I I get the, the sense from the things that I've read, even though nothing directly said it, but that... Olympia Dukakis was probably a real gem. Mm. Like so, there's something that just like between putting the stuff together, uh, I don't know. I think that she probably left a really good impression on people. Probably. And I'm not sure everyone did. Mm. So, Okay, brace yourself. These next ones are tough. Oh, no. So, uh, and then I'm curious. And I, I feel like you probably already know these, but tell me if this is a first time um, learning for you. Okay. The nurse who turns off the life support for Shelby in the movie is the actual nurse who turned off life support for Harling's sister. In fact, all of the hospital support staff in the room helped Harling's sister in her final days in real life. I knew that second part. I didn't realize the first part was so specific. Yeah. And then Harling's mother was on set during the filming of the scenes while Shelby was in the hospital. And during the scene when Shelby has taken off life support, she was asked if she wanted to leave, and she declined, saying that once the scene was over, she wanted to see Shelby get up and walk away. She needed to see Julia Roberts leave because she didn't get to see her daughter do that. That's right. And and from what I read also in the oral history, um, they were very close. So Julia, Julia Roberts, Roberts and the parents. She would, Harling said that it was um, like... The the most surreal thing he had ever experienced. She would cut now. She wasn't like the star that she is Julia today. Roberts. That's right. Mm-hmm. But I think people already saw that in her. Um, but she came over every night and not every night, but a lot of the nights. And she would talk with the parents. She would come over and read them poetry. Um, they would grill out and stuff together. I think she really wanted to get to know them, and she's probably probably exercising some things to make sure that she was able to pull some of that emotion into her work. And it must have worked because she she probably won some awards for it. I wonder if also she was just a young actress who maybe was a little bit homesick and they gave her a sense of home. Uh, probably. Southern, Southern. Yeah. You know. um, and she might just be, I mean, who knows? Where, maybe she's always, just nice. <laughs> she could be. Um, you know, I always feel a little weird talking about real people like this. But um, she can come on and talk to us about it anytime she wants. Anytime. Um, I almost moved to Smyrna. <laughs> but just this idea that, like, um, it, it feels weird because they're real people. But just this idea that, like, uh you know, I, I think you can um, you can go into these parts and know that, like, uh, it's more than just a part. And especially in this one in particular. Like, I think that she was going in there knowing that she, like, if you're playing a real person, I just feel like that's a whole different level of, I don't want to say stress, but responsibility. You know? A real person and a real person whose family and the people who loved her the most are watching. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of responsibility. And on the plays note, like one of the things I didn't include here, but it feels relevant to say is like, I, as I understand it, 
people within that community helped back Mm -hmm. the plague financially the first time around because they cared so much about that family and they cared so much about the loss of the daughter. Why don't we all just live in a small town? I delightful. <laughs> there's upsides and downsides, I think. Um, I don't know I could deal with everyone knowing everything that's going on in my life, but there are a lot you of things just that don't nice. tell them. That's true. Also, nothing in my life is interesting, so that would help at this point. So, so Herbert Ross, this is the director. So he's a little bit of a controversial figure around the I, making So you're going to have to tell me about this. I've read allusions to this, but I haven't read anything specific. Well, he had a pretty contentious relationship with the actors, and he was pretty hard on all of them, but especially Dolly and Julia. So you can just get right on a town as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So after a poor take, he reprimanded Dolly Parton and asked her if she could act. And she replied, no, but it's your job to make me look like I can. And then I get, so I'm assuming this happened more than a few times because on another occasion, I don't know it's the same time, but uh, Sally Field reportedly said, you don't say that to Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton is absolutely the funniest, wittiest, and filthiest, and she will cut you to ribbons. (laughs) Melinda's my favorite. Told you. Or Sally. <laughs> Ooh, that girl. Samesies. Um, it it sounds like he was in a bad place because his wife had died the year prior. Not my problem. <laughs> Not Dolly's problem. But at some point, so Shirley McLean had worked with him <clears throat> in the past, and at some point, I think she pulls him to the side and she ripped him a new one. And things got better from there. Sally Field worked with him two years later on Soap Dish. And she had a contract agreement made that if she had problems with him, she could have him fired and replaced as an executive producer. Oh, God. Now, that is some half ass internet research. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds good, doesn't it? It could be Sally true. Field. I'm going to believe it. She's amazing. So I'll go ahead and tack this one on while, since I just mentioned Soap Dish and we've already talked about it. But Soap Dish would not exist if it wasn't for this movie. So they, I think the whole cast and crew gets really tight knit you know they're in a small community they know each other I think they're hanging out a lot after you know hours or whatever and they're sitting around one night and Harling asks like I think maybe they're all having this conversation if you could play like any one character or do any one thing and Sally Phil basically looks and this is me just paraphrasing here but something along the lines of like I just want to play a character who dresses good and them to stop making me this frumpy, like what? And so, and he, and they created soap dish and oh, she wow. gets to be, um, you know, this soap opera. I have never star heard of this movie. <laughs> that's like well-dressed. I mean, it's got Robert Downey Jr., Whoopi Goldberg, um, Sally Field, Elizabeth Shue. It's a really great movie. So, all right, there's a couple of things that we have to cover that are in the Still Magnolias universe. Do you know they made a sitcom spinoff? This sounds vaguely familiar. It's tough because I assume at this point you've probably read a lot of different things. But Mm -hmm. so it, it debuted on CBS in 1990, but it was canceled. I bet you that CBS worked that whole Designing Women plot line in about Still Magnolias in, um, into the last episodes that we recorded mm-hmm. because they were already working on this. Oh. And it was probably going to wind up being part of the Designing Women Murphy Brown Monday Night All-Female lineup. I had read that the reason Dolly did the episode was because she had said from the very beginning of Dining, Designing Women she loved the show and she wanted to be on it. And this gave her the that. opportunity to do it. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah, she loved the show. But all of these things can be true. This could have been the kismet that brought her to the show. It's all true. It's all, in our world, it is. But the one thing that, that didn't happen is the, that show. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, there you go. But also, like, like what would you do? What would you, uh, I mean, can you just, like, let a thing be? Good yeah. Thing? So, more successful in 2012, Lifetime released an all-black cast version. It was the third most successful telecast at that time, drawing 6.5 million viewers. That's huge for Lifetime. And it was quite an all-star cast, especially since this was before everyone everyone did TV. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Queen Latifah, Alfre Woodward, um, Jill Scott, Felicia Rashad. So, um, we're all in the main cast. All right, some casting what-ifs. I feel like for Still Magnolias, these are pretty well known. But I think I should still touch on them in case anyone doesn't know. Do you know about any of the casting what-ifs for, like, Shelby or anything? 
probably when you say them. Okay. So Meg Ryan, she was under contract actually. So she was a done deal. Trying to picture Meg Ryan. But what, who she is? Picture her as oh. Shelby. <laughs> okay. I was like, uh. But okay. But she asked to get out of it to be in When Harry Met Sally. Mm-hmm. And so this is to me one of those meant to be moments because. In my mind, there's no better Shelby. I cannot imagine Meg Ryan in that role. There's no better Sally. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think, I I feel like Meg Ryan is maybe, and not that she always played, like, a Sally-type role, but Mm -hmm. I think she does that kind of neurotic, Mm -hmm. like, a little bit better, and I don't think Shelby was that. Mm -hmm. So, um, And I love Meg Ryan. I oh, love her. I just don't think that's, this is the right role for her. Right. And yeah. I mean, obviously, and that's why I say, like, I think, obviously, she's done roles that aren't that pinned up. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it's really hard for me to picture, especially since Julia's Southern mm-hmm. um, and is just so naturally able to fall into that accent and everything. I don't know. So, Winona Ryder was also considered, but ultimately they thought she was too young. She was actually only... Two years younger than Julia. For Shelby. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Don't see that either. It's hard. You have to go back to, I almost think, because like eventually Winona like takes on these uh, like darker roles. Beetlejuice. And then Beetlejuice. she's also Beetlejuice. like, right. But she's also like just dark hair and pale skin. She's very severe. Yeah. And, but like when you think about, I'd have to go back to thinking like Edward Scissorhands, Winona Ryder, where she's blonde and like a little softer. Um. So she's got an edge, whereas Julia Roberts feels very approachable and girls next girl next door. Yeah, girl Winona next door in that edge. gorgeous way that never lives next door to you. But sure. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know that way. Yeah. That girl next door model. Right. So Laura Dern was also considered. Um, I could have seen her as an L, actually. Okay. I I'd buy an L. Yeah. There's no other Shelby. I've read conflicting point uh, reports, excuse me, about Daryl Hannah, but she was supposedly turned down for the role of Anel because they thought she was too attractive. It, by this point, she's already done Splash, so she basically played the Little Mermaid. <laughs> um, you know, and she's done a couple of other things where she was just kind of like the hot girl <laughs> next door. Um, but she, uh, apparently she came in dressed as the part. And was so unrecognizable that security refused to let her in. I'm just going to say, I don't know if that's true, but I love those kinds of stories. It sounds good, so I thought I'd retell it anyway. Um, Another big one is that Betty Davis wanted to play Weezer. Mm -hmm. And she actually pitched herself to Robert Harling. I think she, like, invited him to tea or something. It, she also wanted Catherine Hepburn to play Clary and Liz Taylor. I, I've read t- I've read that he, she wanted her to play Truvy, and I've read that she wanted her to play Malin, depending on the source. But either God. way, but <laughs> either way, she wanted that cast of characters in there. That would be a totally different movie. A totally different. And I'm not saying you're talking about some of the greatest actors that ever were in that lineup, but. I just can't see. Can they get past their transatlantic accent and pull out a southern accent? (laughs) It is kind of hard to see the Catherine Hepburn accent in there. Uh, Anyways, that didn't happen. So (laughs) good. (laughs) Truvy was actually written for Harling's friend Margot Martindale. Um, is this one you're familiar with? Mm-mm. Okay, so Margot Martindale, if you look her up, she's more of a character actor, but you you would definitely recognize her. But anyway, so she played the role in its off-Broadway run, and she was supposed to play the part in the movie too, but as far as I understand, Herbert Ross pushed for Dolly. I definitely And then he yelled at her. her. Yeah, that's so mean. Yeah, you see what I'm saying. She's been in everything. I definitely everything. know her. Yeah. She's from Texas. So, well, apparently she's a lot like Truvy in real life because he wrote it inspired by her. She's been on a lot. Oh, yeah. So, but I think like any good character actor, I couldn't immediately pull from anything. Mm -mm. So, as an exercise, if they remade Still Magnolias right now, who would you cast? So, thinking about this, I started with a list of Southern actors to narrow it down immediately. Because, like, I mean, otherwise, you're talking about a universe. So Also, like, you want to be true to... Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I started with Malin. 
I was thinking about like a Jennifer Garner type or maybe even Reese Witherspoon. Okay. Or Mary Louise Parker. Or, hear me out, Julia Roberts. <laughs> Do you want to know who I have down from a limb? Who? Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts. She could be the mom now. Right. Yeah. Actually, I think she's a little older. Yeah. That's how much time has passed, but yeah. It's depressing. Ah, uh, what do you mean? I think it feels great. <laughs> um, Shelby was the hard one for me. Okay, who'd you Shelby. land on? So I went with like a, this was really challenging. It's hard to Because it's hard to know 22-year-olds now? It really got so hard. And, and even I think the two people I picked aren't 22. I think they're in their late 20s. Okay. Uh, Dakota Fanning, she's actually from the Atlanta area. Uh-huh. And the other person I thought of was Selena Gomez. But thinking about Winona Ryder, Selena also tends to have that um, edginess. edginess mm-hmm. And I think she might be a, a bridge too edgy for this one. But those were the two I thought of. Funny, because I picked Elle Fanning. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. Who I have seen. Let me think. Dakota. She's a really good actor. Dakota is too. Well, yeah. But I just thought she was too old. Which I can't. I'm sorry. Oh, God. How's that feel? Ouch. She is too old to play like a 20-year-old. I mean, not really. I guess she could, but her little sister's just sitting right there and also really good. I think if we made the movie today, I do think um, Shelby would have to be a little bit older. Like, there just aren't a ton of fresh out of college 22-year-olds trying to have babies. You know what I mean? That's true. That's a fair point if you're really going to update it all around. That's not this exercise, though. Right. (laughs) Who's next? Well, um... How about, did you pick out some, oh, you know what? I may have told you not to pick out someone for drum, but I did. I have someone. Okay, who'd you get? Um, So you think Gerald McRaney's too old? He's too old, right? I think so. He's too old. Uh, So the next one was. But I like that pick, though. It's two opposite ends of the spectrum. The other one was maybe like a Matthew McConaughey. Uh Uh-uh. I have Matthew McConaughey or Walter Goggins. Walter Goggins. From Justified, and then he's also on... Give me something I know. Uh, oh, I know Vice him. Principals, like he was on Sons of Anarchy. Um, he is definitely Southern, does a wonderful Southern accent, and he's also incredibly funny. Um, so I think he could really play that part pretty well. But I have Matthew McConaughey down too, because I just couldn't make up my mind, and I thought him and Julia Roberts would look good together. Yeah, Even sure. though they don't really talk in the movie. Yeah, that's fine. Um, how about Truvy? Truvy. I mean, Dolly could still do it. That's true. I, I totally agree with that. Is that who you have then? I have several options. Okay, so, this was hard, wasn't it? Yes. Uh-huh. In the vein of Dolly, Miley Cyrus could be another option. She's okay. a little airing a little young, but yeah. she's in real life. She's Dolly's goddaughter, right. and they have that same Tennessee vibe. Uh-huh. Um. I also, as I was looking through the list, I found Beyonce, and I was like, okay, here, hear me out. She's from Texas. Yep. Um, Drop dead gorgeous. Yep. And she can be really, really funny. Yeah. That would be like a, su- she, I, I doubt. And someone, everyone in the world would come see this movie. It, she'd be <laughs> delightful. It doesn't matter what role he plays. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So that okay. would be an interesting, that could be interesting. All right. Are you ready for this? Or do yeah. you have more? No, I does it. I'm good. Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, I have her for someone else. Or Reba McIntyre. Because I was just going to do with the country music singer vibe. I have Reba for somebody else. Oh, look at that. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So um, how about Anel? Anel. You know, I th- this was really hard for me. Dakota Fanning. Dakota Fanning. <laughs> Can I just say, Dakota, when you're listening, Fanning I want to be sisters. very clear that I'm probably 10 years older than you. So You're you were old. not old for this world. You were just old to play Shelby at 20. You know, Chrissy. And you're really not because I've seen you and you still look like you're 20. Man. You know, Chrissy Metz from This Is Us. Uh, yes. The sister. The sister. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do we think she she could be an interest? She's from Florida. She could be an interesting take on this. For she's, Anel. For Anel. Because I, I think, think of that- Anel as a supporting character, not as a main character. I, I like the idea. I still, I think I was way too strict on age. Oh, yeah. So I need to be more flexible with that. Um, with that, Selena? That's just what that, you need to be. That flexible. one thing, everything else, I'm super flexible and so laid back. I picked Antonia Gentry. 
for Anel from Jenny in Georgia. She's the daughter. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, because I do feel like um, there's a uh, a quietness to Anel that I feel like she could capture. Um, but she's still like a character who is um, magnetic, mm-hmm. but in like a subdued way. Mm-hmm. And in my watch of Jenny and Georgia, that's what I see from that actor. Okay. How about Weezer? So Sandra Bullock is maybe a little too young, but I feel like she captures snarky and surly. You know what's crazy? Really I'm well. not sure they're that far apart in age. They if might we not be. Looked. I think it's just like... First of 2023 all, aging versus the late eighties. Yeah, it's just it's just a different time period. But yeah, I had f- her down at first on the fl- for her. I think it was for her on the flip. This is where I thought Reba McIntyre might be really good. Um, she's got a lot of charisma. She tends to be a little she's, too sunny. She can be fiery though. Yeah, she's a redhead. When it when Barbara Jean got on her nerves, she got real fiery. She really, really did. So I think she could be good there. Okay, I have Octavia Spencer. God, do you have her? Who's she? What about Octavia as Clary? I put Daryl Hannah. Oh. I thought we could bring her back in a role. So I have Octavia Spencer as Clary, Andy McDowell, and then this is the other place I thought maybe Kristen Chenoweth. You know what? She plays a really good, like, (laughs) Zsa kind of person. Yeah. (laughs) You can tell I can't Zsa Zsa it up. Um, I'm like, Whoa, um, is my version of that. Uh, yeah, I, I think all of those are good. This is what made it such an interesting exercise. I actually also just thinking back to one person who I thought could have played Shelby back in the day was Andy McDowell. Mm-hmm. Um, although she was a, a little, she's a little older. She's got that super... God, she's the most beautiful woman I think I've ever seen. She's really beautiful. She's soft, soft. but also... She can be hard headed and firm, like in like in Groundhog Day. There's also something about the hair. Is the hair. I yeah. just like I can't you need a, I can't a dramatic hair, hair moment with Shelby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So what about for I did actually also include Jackson. So me too. Okay. I went ahead, you know, when you tell me you don't have to do that, then I realize I probably should go ahead and be prepared because it's gonna come up. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I chose Chris Hemsworth because he does accents really well. I th- and he's beautiful. I think he might have done the accent. Um, it might have even been a Southern accent in the Vacation reboot. Oh, yeah. So I think he could do that. And then um, Andrew Garfield, because we were just talking about him in that Tammy Faye movie. Mm-hmm. Also very attractive man. Mm-hmm. He could play this role pretty well. And I think they're both more or less in that right age range. Okay. I went with someone young. Oh. Like, I mean, <laughs> let me be clear. <laughs> Where is this? Headed? These other people are young too, but I kept trying to think in this like, oh my god, who is under twenty five? Right, which was like a very brain busting exercise for me. But I was thinking about Josh Hutcherson, um, who is from uh, Kentucky. What's the age difference between him and like Chris Hemsworth or like the other one? What who did I just say? I think well, Josh Hutcherson, I think is about at least six years younger, if not much. Not 10 years younger than us. 30. Okay, so seven. Did you look up anyone else that you... That was all my casting. Oh, one more person with Spud. Okay. Tim McGraw. Love it. Like, he's handsome. He's like a little rough edges. I think he'd be good. That's it. Yeah, that's good. I like it. As far as I made it. All right. So the other thing I have here is I thought that before we got into references... We could talk about the Venn diagram that is still Magnolia's in Designing Women. So the most obvious is that the Designing Women ladies are going to see still Magnolia's together. So the movie literally exists within the Designing Women universe. That doesn't always happen in shows, you know, where you get like real life references like that, Mm -hmm. um, especially that are that current. Dolly Parton is the inextricable link as main cast in still Magnolia's and guest star in Designing Women. And then Bernice's almost wedding bridesmaid dresses were somehow almost the exact same as Shelby's, which is something that we discussed back when Bernice almost got married in season three. Then years later in 2005, Delta Burke starred in Still Magnolias on Broadway as Truvy. How do you feel about that? Uh, Yeah, I don't see that. She was well-reviewed. 
Okay. They just, they, I think the review I read said that she was a more subdued Truvy. Yeah. But she captured that warmth really well. Okay. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> you shared um, this in the Annie Potts Extra Sugar, and then we talked about it again early on in the last episode, but um, this is part of that crossover. In 2012, Robert Harling wrote the TV series GCB, which stars Annie Potts, who was channeling her inner Julia Sugarbaker. Oh, goodness, it's full circle. On a more serious note, the movie is largely based around Shelby's fight with type 1 diabetes. And as we've discussed, Jean Smart has type 1 diabetes and has been a really big advocate for years. On top of that, you know, when I was wa- putting all this together, thinking about the fact that she was pregnant during the season. So I imagine this movie probably hit differently for her. That's true. Um, I also think there's a case that each of the designing women are an archetype. So they match up pretty well with the Still Magnolias cast. I'm going to give you the layout of the land here, and you can tell me if you think I have just lost my mind or not. Okay? So I have Sally Field as a Mary Jo. Here are my uh, backup supporting points, okay? She's sweet, but with a fiery side. She doesn't like to show when things get to her. She's very private and fiercely protective of her kids. Okay. <laughs> I'll buy it. Okay. Anel as a Charlene. They both kiss a lot of frogs to find their prince. They are both tall, leggy blondes, both very spiritual, and both had pregnancy plot lines. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're winning at life, Selena. <laughs> I've got Weezer as a Suzanne. They're both loud. They both wear fur coats in the South where it's hot. So it doesn't make any sense. Animal lovers. And they're both very eccentric and rich. Except for when Suzanne is not. It's unclear. (laughs) On occasion when she's not. Right. And then I have Clary as a Julia. They're both strong women. Both have well-to-do family names and interest in politics. And both lost their husbands. There you go. No one is Dolly Parton. <laughs> Pretty. There's only one Truvy. <laughs> oh, you know, I go with that. I go with that. <laughs> or Anthony. Anthony, because he is also <laughs> one of a kind. And we know that they're the best. Um, so, but you, are you ready to run through outdated things or 80s references? <laughs> sure. I, know, I feel like you need to take a break. Maybe just a deep My breath. Water's very low. Uh, so... Anel wanted to go through hair magazines at the beginning. Uh, Truvy says, Just, it's it's critical to stay abreast of the latest. <laughs> I don't know. That feels 80s. Uh-huh. Uh, Anel lost her contact working through the festival, walking through the festival, and then like tried to get it back because it's a hard contact, I'm sure, and they only have so many of those. That's not something that happens today. Mm-hmm. Clary working at and buying a radio station. Yeah. Uh, Malin gave Jack Jr. a bottle full of apple juice or some kind of juice at the hair salon. That's just really not a thing you do nowadays before they really have teeth or they have baby teeth. It's just not great. It's a lot of sugar. Mm. Sugar and then something about the sucking of the bottle at his age just was not a great fit. Um, Shelby crawling to get to a landmine. Mm. Uh, Jackson's mother's glasses at the funeral get me every single time. They are super horn-rimmed. Oh, are they really? Super horn-rimmed. Like, if you didn't know that movie was made in the late 80s and you were watching it for the first time, you would have thought late 60s, early 70s, looking at those glasses. They probably were. right? Probably. (laughs) That's probably right. And then the last one I had in dated references was that um, Clary says, you are too twisted for color TV. It's a a great line. (laughs) Um, Okay. So, I, I mean, it's like they took the 80s and spewed it through a fire hose. The clothes, the decor, the hair, but the teasing you know of the so hair. what's so funny is I did not catch, like, the hair, obviously, because they're in a hair salon. But, like, for the most part, it didn't look very dated to me, honestly. It mm-hmm. should have. It didn't. I mean, it's just these things, like, when you look at the decorations around the house. I um, think I'm desensitized to it because we've been watching Designing Women so much. That's fair. I'm <laughs> at the point where this just feels normal to me. Oh, gosh. The, it was, man, it was really something with the teasing of the hair and just seeing them do it. Yeah. Gosh, so much teasing. All Ooh. that damage. Please tell me that the wedding looked dated to you. Yes. Oh, okay. for sure. Yes. 
Uh, I think for at least like most of my life watching this movie, I've always looked at that wedding and been like, yeah, that's a lot going on. My grandmother had a pink bathroom. When uh-huh. I was growing up, and when I see that wedding scene. I think we all scene, had a grandma with a pink bathroom growing up. pink bathroom. <laughs> Especially, like, the mauve. Yeah. It was a big time for mauve. Yeah. So, S- Spud smoking inside the house. Weezer smoking oh, inside that. the hospital. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's dated. Cool. Uh, yeah, that'll get you arrested now. Um, decorating the car at a wedding. With condom. That's a day, that's of days gone by, huh? You don't see that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, yeah. unfortunately, there might have also been some Confederate flags involved. Yeah, I have that on the list. Okay. That, that did not age that well. That's in my not. Southern references. <laughs> but, yeah, I have never noticed that before this watch. That's oh. what I was saying. Like, anytime you get a close read on things, you're like, oh, God. Don't look too close. Yeah, I was, like, watching it, and I was like, is he wearing, is he carrying a sword? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So calling condoms rubbers, that felt dated. Do not decorate my car with rubbers. There's a line where Truvy says, oh, get with it, Clary. This is the 80s. If you can achieve puberty, you can achieve a past. So it's just funny to me that everything's complicated in the moment. Like, oh, it's the 80s. It's the 90s. Get Mm. with it. It's 2023. But anytime we reflect back on the moment, we're like, oh, such a simple time. (laughs) I'm like, oh, everybody's full of crap. (laughs) Jackson says that the VCR alone is worth marrying for. Then later in the movie, one of Shelby's brothers comes in with a videotape. All of Vanell's Christmas decorations on the porch that you talked about earlier, but they've also all had a moment again. Yeah. (laughs) So especially like the big Christmas lights. Uh Uh-huh. And then just this like idea of a coming out story as novelty and their fascination with the experience of a gay man. Oh. I felt like that has, like, that just really feels of that time. I don't think that, like, you would sit around and necessarily have, like, a full-fledged conversation about that. All that said, rent-free in my head lives all gay men have track lighting (laughs) and all gay men are named Mark Rick or Steve. (laughs) Uh, Q Weezer's nephew Steve. That's right. Track lighting. That's right. So, biggest Southern things. What stood out for you? Uh, You already mentioned uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana, which is where it was filmed. Just enough to say that it was originally established in 1714 and incorporated in 1819 after Louisiana became a state in 1812. (laughs) It's the oldest permanent settlement as part of the Louisiana Purchase. A Christmas Cajun, that's the song that's playing during Anel's Christmas decoration setup. Uh It says, we'll have a Cajun Christmas. But if you Google a Cajun Christmas, you get a Christmas Cajun as the name of the song. That's confusing. Oh, that is confusing. But there you go. Huh. Red beans and rice. That's what Sammy suggests they take to Malin's house before the surgery, and which we had for lunch today. <laughs> the Piggly Wiggly is where they do their grocery shopping. And I, I brought up the Easter egg hunt at the end with all the kids in their ruffled socks and bonnet hats. That feels very Southern to me. Yeah, definitely. Um, Those were the highlights. Let me be clear. It's a Southern movie. It's, a, it's all Southern. <laughs> it's all I know. Southern. Moving on. Um, so a nickname like Spud. <laughs> And then actually every single name sounds really Southern. And then I always forget, and I wind up spelling Weezer like the 90s band. Let me be very clear. They're obviously still a band, but they did get their start in the 90s. Um, In my entire life, I have never known someone named Malin or Weezer. No, but they are real names that he pulled. So crazy. Yeah, he pulled them from like his family tree or something. Mm. Um, So... Let's see. I also just felt like Sally Field's reaction to things in this movie were very like of a stereotype of a Southern woman, especially at the beginning of the movie. Just like she's completely exasperated and exhausted by things, but like also like just she's not really going to let you see it. Mm. There's just like this stillness about her. Um, and Steel Magnolia, would you say? I might say that. Um Southern Hair Magazine is not real from what I've found, but a lot of people, one, have Googled for it. And number two, I did find a prop master who makes and sells fake ones Excellent. for runs of Still Magnolias on stage. Perfect. <laughs> Having a hair studio in your house. I don't know we own that per se, but I absolutely know that's true to my Southern experience. Currently, the woman doing my hair does it in a salon that she has set up in her home. Mm-hmm. So. The gossip everywhere in this movie. 
But like, especially at the hair salon and this iconic line that you've already talked about, you know, I don't like to talk ill about anybody, but as Clarity says, if you don't have anything nice to say, come sit by me. Also, apparently ripped off from Alice Roosevelt Longworth. So, mm, okay. There you go. Just for your back pocket. There's the part earlier in the movie, too, when um, Dolly Parton says, you know, I'd rather step on my own lips than talk bad about my can, but, or something like that, uh-huh. and then continues to say something terrible. That's right. Yeah. Wedding stuff, being forced to have all your family in your wedding feel Southern, having mm. not, I mean, that's probably Lots universal, but nine bridesmaids that feels very southern the groom's cake southern the shape southern that was also based on a real experience that harlan had at a wedding so it was actually um an armadillo what he invented was the red velvet part oh good and he is credited with much to your chagrin nikki reviving the red velvet cake god so gross then i wrote down some southern quotes Jackson is from a good old Southern family with good old Southern values. You either shoot it, stuff it, or marry it. That's what really melts my butter. How about a glass of iced tea? It's the house wine of the South. I'm an old Southern woman, and we're supposed to wear funny-looking hats and ugly clothes and grow vegetables in the dirt. Don't ask me those questions. I don't know why. I don't make the rules. And then some of the people at the wedding wear what? Oh, we talked about that. Moving on, the food. Cuppa, 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 uh, which is the recipe that Truvy shares. It's basically um, cobbler. Cup of flour, cup of... Cup of flour, cup of sugar, cup of fruit cocktail. Fruit cocktail. With the juice. At the Christmas festival, they're serving a low country boil, and then Truvy brings home fried chicken. And then we... got good old Southern Christians. That's right. Anel pours out Sammy's Dixie beer. This is, in <laughs> fact, a real beer from a New Orleans brewery that was founded in 1907, and it was Dixie Brewing Company, but in 2021 was renamed Faber Brewing Company. Sorry, I looked up a lot of stuff. She and also I wasn't... called it liquor. Did she really? Beer's not liquor, is it? But, you know, I think that's pretty true to the experience. Someone pouring out alcohol probably doesn't really know the right nomenclature. <laughs> And then just props to the prop master, because that's a really good detail to, like, have pulled New Orleans beer and made sure that was on site. And just to think on Designing Women, they couldn't even get the scenery outside the window, right? (laughs) Ah, It's tough, you know? And then we can't leave Southern references without talking about the accents in this movie. Do you think there is a best or worst? Um... Or wow. both. I wasn't prepared for that question. I'm so sorry. I mean, obviously Dolly Parton's is great. I, I don't know that I could put them on a ranking. That's fair. I didn't watch with that. That's fair. I, I picked that. I picked Dolly. I also picked Shirley. I think that Shirley McLean's accent was really good. I think Anel's is the worst, but still fine. Huh. I'd have to watch it with that thought in mind. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to catch you off guard. I kind of actually forgot to put this in here, so you'll just have to. Bear with me. Um, While you think on, in case anything strikes you, but I did look into who was actually from the South or not. We've obviously already talked about a couple of these individuals that we know just by heart. So Dolly Parton, Tennessee. Julia Roberts, Georgia. Shirley MacLaine is also from the South. She's from Virginia. Um, Sally Field, Pasadena, California. (laughs) She does such a good Southern accent, She does. Forrest Gump, this movie. Yeah. I think she was in the... Um, when you're good, you're good. Yeah. Olympia Dukakis. <laughs> she can't be Southern. Massachusetts. Ah, perfect. And then Daryl Hannah's from Chicago. So there was one woman who all the local women thought had the most accurate accent. Any guesses? Olympia Dukakis. Yep. <laughs> they just loved her. I, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> so I was like piecing it together. Her. I was like, I don't know. She even sounds Southern. I think she does. I think she sounds like that Charleston Southern. It's so funny. Like, I, again, I, that's why I say I would have to watch it because I think I'm so far past trying to poke holes in this movie because it's so ingrained in my mind that, like, it's impossible for me to be like, and they're just making up accents. We were it able to tough. do that early in Designing Women. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure I could do that exercise now with Designing Women. So. 
that's that's a tough that's a tough exercise for me. Well, what was funny to me is if they weren't just in love with Olympia. Okay. And please, God, next time I yeah. watch Steel Magnolias, <laughs> I hope I don't watch it thinking Daryl Hannah is such a bad accent. <laughs> Now I'm going to be in my head forever. I'm like, That's oh. why I was surprised when we did the Bannister buffs of Atlanta. And I told you, I said, the woman who comes in and she's like the manager or whatever, she sounds just like Anel to me. Mm. And I never thought Anel's accent was that good. It was just always a little overplayed for me, mm. which is why I absolutely thought that when I went to go look for where that actor was from, I could have just sworn she was going to be from the Midwest or something. Mm -hmm. And she was from the South. So that's why I said, like, to me, it's the worst one out of all of them. Mm -hmm. But it still sounds like this other woman's from, who's from the South. So it's it's whatever, you know. Who knows? We're just making this stuff up, guys. We're just <laughs> making it up. Um, so references we need to talk about. Do you have anything here? The only one I wrote down was uh, Spud made a reference to Circus of the Stars when he was working on the car. Um it's one of the few pop culture references in the movie. And I have heard of Circus of the Stars. I couldn't have told you what it was. I can now tell you that it was an annual television special broadcast by CBS mm -hmm. in the United States in which celebrities performed circus-type acts. They had 19 shows in total. The first was broadcast in 1977, the last in 19, 1994. Uh, over the years, the series featured many leading movie and television stars. Dixie Carter and Delta Burke both appeared on it at some point. So this is your Designing Women tie-in. Oh, my goodness. It's also weird, too, because I think... C so, like, CBS is, like, behind this movie. It's, you know... It's, somewhere. Yeah, and, and, like, somewhere in, like, the um, dissemination or something. Mm -hmm. And it's just so funny, like, how... It, it's almost like a little bit of like a letdown to hear some of these things because mm. you're like, they're like, just find a way to work in our titles to our shows. D speaking of, <laughs> oh, what? I was watching King of Queens last night. She had a stack of uh, post-it notes sitting on her desk and it was uh, Nordic Trek branded. Just randomly in a lawyer's office, she has a stack of Nordic Trek post-it notes on her desk. Of course. What Brand else would endorsement is so crazy. It's so weird. Um, so speaking of that, Coca-Cola. I had never noticed it before. There is Coke, oh. <laughs> a cola, in so many of these scenes. Yeah. And a lot of it's glass bottles, which I thought was unique. Um, oh, yeah. I think people like see that as Southern. I think I think that's right. Um, it's not my experience, but sure. Now all I can think of is Anel saying, I'll have a cherry Coke. <laughs> You're right. She does have the worst accents. I'm so sorry. So, um, so there, like, I, I did look into it, and I think the bottom line is, because I almost put this as a Southern reference, because it's smart to have Coca-Cola in there, but the way, it, you know, it's in the South. It's not Atlanta, but it's, you know, Coca-Cola is Atlanta-based, and so for that reason, like, it feels like it could be, like, a smart, like, hey, we realize we're in the South. But then after like the 15th time I saw it, I was like, okay, this is just product placement. And what I will say without going into the details is it is. Yeah. <laughs> so an exclusive deal struck with Coke. Well, we'll link to the, uh, we'll link to an article from the New York Times from 1989 about it for all our advertising enthusiasts. <laughs> Cause it's, it's a deep cut, but it's out there. The other one that was really bothering me is whether or not Anne Boleyn really had 11 fingers. <laughs> No. Yeah, what'd you find out? I don't know. Oh no. <laughs> it sounds like it was made up probably by like there was like a little bit of a I don't know if you guys know your history around this very well, but a little bit of a Catholic Protestant thing going on at this time. And it sounds like it was a little bit of propaganda against her from a man who never even really saw her in real life. Um, and so even though at the time, I think it was probably being reported as fact, now more time has marched on and now historians, it sounds like, feel a little bit differently. So but there we you go. all believe she does because Olympia Dukakis taught us so. <laughs> but I'm here to speak the truth. <laughs> That's all she wrote. Oh, boy, Selena. Did it live up to your expectation? Was this everything you wanted it to be? Have you said everything you need to say? 
about Steel Magnolias. I could never have said everything I need to say, but I have said everything that maybe we have three listeners still around (laughs) who have made it this far, and so you and I do not pass out at the table. (laughs) All right. Well, our next episode, we're going back to our regularly scheduled programming, so we're going to talk about Designing Women, episode 14, The Mistress. Everyone can follow along with us and engage. That is, we'd love everyone to follow along with us and engage. Instagram and Facebook at Sweet Tea and TV. TikTok Sweet Tea TV Pod. Our email is Sweet Tea TV Pod at gmail.com. Our website is www.sweettv.com. There are several ways to support the show. Uh, you can tell your family and friends about us, write and review the podcast wherever you listen. And we have some additional ways to support the show on the Support Us tab of our website. And come back Thursday, we're going to explore the life and legend of the greatest hick who ever lived, designing women's words, not mine, Miss Dolly Parton. If you didn't tack it on, I was going to. (laughs) I'm like, that's not Nikki saying that. (laughs) I only talk about Miss Parton with full respect. Well, you know what that means. What does it mean, Selena? It means we love you more than our luggage, and we'll see you around the bend.